Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Inspire Health Podcast. And today we are bringing in a guest that is an expert in an area that we have actually had a lot of conversation about over the past, um, well, for the past several months, but particularly even just over the past um, week or two. Mm -hmm. And we're bringing in Patrick Ferenga, and he's a writer, publisher, and education activist who worked closely with the late author and teacher John Holt and continues his work today as a president of Holt GWS LLC. After Holt died, Pat published Growing Without Schooling magazine, GWS, from 1985 until it stopped in 2001. GWS is the first periodical about learning without going to school, started by Holt in 1977. The Fringa unschooled their daughters, now aged 37, 34, and 30. Pat speaks as a homeschooling expert in education at education conferences around the world. He's been on radio and television shows. He co-authored Teach Your Own, the John Holt book of homeschooling, and many articles about homeschooling and essays about unschooling in a number of different publications. And we are super excited to talk to him about all of this concept around schooling and learning and homeschooling, unschooling today. So Patrick, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure. Yes, we came across your work and we were so excited to run through your book. And like Taya was saying, we've had been inundated this last little while in prep. And not that we had actually put out that we were going to be interviewing you at this time, but it's just spontaneously, we've gotten a lot of emails and texts from people that have actually recently wanted to make the switch from the school system here. We're in Canada, from the school system in Canada and moving out more to homeschooling or unschooling and just looking for more resources so we thought this is incredibly timely that we have you on here and to I talk th- about all of this and i think after the conversation we were having with um dr tom cowan there was the topic of schooling that spontaneously came up within that conversation or rather de-schooling because he spoke of i'm not sure if you're familiar with the author um ivan Elit. Oh, I studied with uh, Yvonne. Oh, yes. very cool. Okay, so he's no longer with us, but I started mm-hmm. to actually research his work, and then I came across um, Holt's um, information mm-hmm. as well, which then tied me to to you. So, I mean, and we're like, is... we can talk to someone that's actually still here yes. that's been doing <laughs> for right. a long time. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and <laughs> has also raised his own children through mm-hmm. uh, a similar way. So. Um, we're excited to speak with you and pick your brain and hear of your experiences and, and insights because your your kids are much older now. So then we're able to kind of look into the future a little bit and see how they have what their process has been and where they've landed within a society that really praises schooling. And I feel like mm-hmm. a lot of parents are now seeing the regular school system um as not really conducive to nurturing curiosity and wonder but a little bit more like indoctrination these days so we're looking Mm -hmm. for other options and we're excited to dive into all of this with you pat i'd i'd love to learn your story as far as how did you end up moving into this world of homeschooling and and unschooling especially because you did this like decades ago when it would have been even much more uh, I would say less common than it is even now where people are even sort of starting to embark on that. So I'd love to hear your story. Sure. Well, uh, briefly, I didn't know anything about uh, homeschooling or John Holt when I, when I came into this. I, I had graduated. I was going to be a writer, a copywriter, um, or teach English. I got my master's degree in English literature. I thought, you know, that, that was my path. But then uh, when I graduated uh, from graduate school in uh, 1980, they weren't hiring teachers. They were firing teachers all around, all across, you know, they, we had these things called property tax rollback bills. So they were reducing property taxes, which reduced funding for the schools. And so they weren't hiring. They were, they were laying off, you know. So uh, I wound up doing what most English majors wind up doing at some point in their life. And that's work in a bookstore. But fortunately for me, the cash, one of the cashiers there, uh, her husband was volunteering at the Holt office. And the Holt office was just uh, upstairs from the bookstore on Boylston Street in uh, Copley Square in Boston. And um, I didn't know John. I wouldn't have recognized him at that time, but he, he did frequent the bookstore. But he, he also frequented a lot of bookstores. He was a, quite an avid reader. And um, 
And actually, teach your own. Uh, so this would be 1981 now. I'd worked in the bookstore for about a year after I graduated. And, you know, I, I was looking to get, um, move up in the world, right? And so back then, word processing was the, the, the big technical skill you had to learn. They actually had separate machines called word processors. You know, and John had an Olivetti word processor. And here in Boston, Wang Computers was a big, they, uh, and they're no longer in business, but they were so big in the 80s that the, the, the opera house was renamed the Wang Opera House in Boston. <laughs> you know? But, you know, it gives you an idea of how transitory these technological advances can be. So, you know, I, I, I spoke with um, the, my friend and she said, oh, why don't you go up and volunteer at the Holt office? And you know, her husband, then we'll teach you to use a word processor. And in return, you type up labels and correspondence for John Holt in, in his business. And it sounded good to me. So, you know, I went up there a couple of nights a week with Tim and, and learned the basics. And I was doing that um, on and off for about two months. John Holt was nowhere to be seen because he had just come out with Teach Your Own. And uh, that was one of my first jobs was to take it out of the, the box, you know, the hardcover editions of Teach Your Own and put them on the bookshelves because we sold, uh, you know, that was how we supported the magazine was uh, through the book sales uh, of books that John recommended and also books that he, that he had written. And, um, and I was, remember thinking to myself, boy, this guy's crazy. <laughs> Teach Your Own, how are they going to get into college? What is this going on, you know? Uh, and um, sure enough, you know, I'm trying to make a long story short. Um, John came back from uh, his, his uh, it was a, actually a three month tour of Scandinavia addressing various universities and dealing with all the uh, standard objections to uh, homeschooling, particularly in 1981, as you can imagine how, how foreign that sounded to people then. Although, John, like I said, John started the magazine in 1977 because he discovered that there were many people out there already homeschooling. And he said, well, this is different. This is something I can get behind. You know, I'm done with school reform. No one wants to change the schools you know, in any meaningful way. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, 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 was, I was just there at, at, at the very beginning of all, of all this stuff. But John had already been through the mill, so to speak. And uh, I came up there to volunteer one night and there was the man himself sitting there, as, as I learned later on, that that was one of his favorite places to be, sitting in the book stacks, just reading books. <laughs> I mean, the man, uh, Ivan Illich was even a greater reader. Uh, when I stayed with him, he would teach it down at Penn State. And uh, when I was down there with him, they would deliver a stack of books to him to read that night. And he did. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. But there was John Holt. You know, John would sit in the, you know, there, he'd read at least a book a night or two, you know. Uh, so, you know, there, you know, I, I was immediately taken by by that because you know, I'm a reader. I like that, you know. But uh, when I when John asked, asked me, um, and he said, what do you want to do, Pat? Obviously, you know, you know, you don't want to just be you know, packing books for me the rest of your life. And so I said, oh, I want to be a teacher. And John looked at me and said, why? <laughs> and I said, because I like working with children. And I'll never forget it. He took his glasses off and looked me square in the eye and said, Pat, you got it wrong. If you're going to, you know, teach, you're not going to work with children. You're going to work on children. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And I was immediately thinking of all the kind, wonderful teachers I had, and you know, and, and da, da da da. And John was like, "Look, I've just been talking about this for months. <laughs> There's no objections. Have you read any of my books?" I said, "No." Have you ever read anything by Evelyn Illich? Said, "No." And he said, "Well, why don't you read something by him or me, and then we can talk?" <laughs> right. So um, I, I picked up Teach Your Own. It was, I mean, it was his latest book. And it made no sense to me. So I remember talking to uh, his office manager, Peggy Durkee, and uh, she said, well, why don't you start with his first book? Because all his books build on the next one. It's like you can read his, his intellectual journey in, in education through this. So I read How Children Fail, and it made perfect sense to me. That, because, you know, I, I went to, to, to both public and then private schools. I went to a, a Jesuit high school. So I, I really knew the prep school mentality. And John was writing about like very exclusive uh, elite schools, many of which are still in existence in Massachusetts. You know, they serve the creme of the, the professor's families and so on around here. You know, but what John discovered, you know, uh, from his teaching in, the, in these schools was that what was going on was a charade of learning, as he called it. I would teach, you know, I would teach, give them a test on Friday. They would pass, give them the same test on Monday. Very few of them would pass. And so he wanted to know, I teach, but they don't learn what's going on. 
And so he found a colleague, Bill Hull, who also agreed with him. So they they agreed that one would sit in the back of the class while the other taught, and the person in the back would simply take notes. And um, that's the basis of how children fail. John noticing, like you know, uh, how how the he as a teacher got got wrapped up, you know, because he would get so frustrated. With, with the kids not getting something that he thought was so obvious and easy. Like if there were three answers on the board, you know, he would start pointing at the correct answer on the board unconsciously. And, you know, and when Bill noticed that, you know, he was like, yeah, you know, this is, this really is like a big game we're playing with the kids, you know? Um, and so he started to change the way he taught. He was a very conventional teacher by his own description for like the first 10, 15 years of his career. But then he started, you know, to, to relate things to the real world. He started to bring in typewriters so the kids could learn typing and spelling at the same time. He uh, bought in trumpets. He loved music. So he bought in musical instruments and stuff and, you know, movement and games. He was a soccer coach in one of his first teaching positions. And other teachers got upset. Other students got upset because they couldn't be in Mr. Holt's class. <laughs> and, and he got fired. <laughs> he got fired fired from all of his teaching positions after that, but his book became a bestseller. So then after that, his next book was How Children Learn. You know, and he, now he said, I understand how, you know, what's going on. The classroom is an artificial environment that makes children scared. It makes the adults fearful that, you know, uh, they, are, they're, they're, they may say the wrong thing or um, get in trouble with the administration if they go off task, stuff like that. So, uh, but how did children learn? So he, he, he was, had uh, two sisters and um, they both had children. And uh, John, you know, lived with uh, one of them in New Mexico. And she was the one that suggested he become a teacher, um, you know, and, and suggested his, his first a, a job employment. But, uh, and that was because she said, oh, you're good with kids. You know, our kids, you know, you really, you know, you should really do this. So what John realized, and it's so obvious, but even today, like I, I, I say things like, you know, well, children learn to walk and talk and socialize without being, you know, formally instructed, you know, and, you know, that was an insight back in the 60s that was kind of radical. But now it's just like people go, so what? I taught my, my kid to walk. And it just blows my mind. It's like, wait a minute. You mean you actually, you know, or, or you taught them, how to, you know, I mean. The, this whole idea that we only learn things unless we're taught them is, is become so totally ingrained in our society. And, and John was, was, was very adamant that children are good at learning. In fact, um, one of his last books is called Learning All the Time. You know, it's all about how young children, um, you know, preschool age, learn to walk, talk, and calculate without being taught. I mean, it's, it's obvious to, to most parents who, who watch this process carefully. And so he said, why can't we make this, you know, engage this process further as they develop, as they grow older? Why, why put them in all these assumptions that you must learn to read by the time you're in third grade? You know, late reading is actually a very common phenomenon among homeschoolers and particularly boys. But in school, if you don't read by third grade, you're, you're considered a problem <laughs> you know you're gonna you're you're you know you're gonna be learning disabled or getting get some sort of uh remedial work separated from the class you know so you know john wanted to work with like schools that, that were trying to help people do that and so he became well known um in the late 60s um as a re school reformer uh, he testified before Congress because, you know, at the time the student rebellions on campus were going on about the Vietnam War and all the social uh, activism. And uh, Congress wanted to know what was going on with education. So, you know, John, John was so famous at the time they, they had him testify at one point. But by 1971, John had given up on schools. You know, he said, you know, you know, you got the public schools that are like act like hard jails. And then you have the alternative schools, which are soft jails. <laughs> you know, but you still got to put your kid in a school and, and keep him out of the mainstream of life for as long as possible. So he wanted to know what else could could happen. So then then his books, like the, the title say, it, Escape from Childhood, The Needs and Rights of Children. He thought by if children had the same rights as adults, as any citizen has, they would be able to be freer in their explorations of the world. Well, that 
that never caught on and still hasn't. You know, I mean, people really think that children are property that 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 they need to manage instead of children, people that you know that grow and develop of their own accord and need nurturing, you know, not instruction all the time. Um, and and so you know, and then he came and and then he wrote a book called What What Do I Do Monday, which is all these ideas about what teachers could do instead of the standard curriculum. Um, and uh, I won't go through all the books. But it was his book, Instead of Education, where at the very end, uh, he's offering like all these, like looking at museums and libraries and 4-H and YMCAs and all these other spaces where children learn and grow and, and, and interact with adults. I mean, that's another important point, point is that it's not just a, a kingdom of children. It wants them involved in the world so that they could see you know, how adults use the skills we want them to learn. And so at the end of Instead of Education, John called for an underground railroad to help children escape the deadly effects of compulsory education. And that, you know, a lot of people who called it, particularly educators, refer to that book as a screed and uh, just an absolute, you know, nuts, nuts old book. But that book, that conclusion made people write to John Holt and say, Oh, you don't have to have an underground railroad. You can teach them yourself. And so we found out that there were families in, in Washington State and California, all across, the, and then eventually the world, you know, were writing to him saying, you can homeschool. So we wanted to find out more about this. And that was in uh, 1976 when that came out. And within a year, John published the first issue of Growing Without Schooling magazine, where he said, I just want to form a, a nexus where all these people can communicate, you know, and that, that we can discuss the issues, and um, and that's and then I came in in 1981, and you know that was growing quite large at the time. He had been on a, a the Donahue show, and I'm fortunate enough that I, 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 I someone had a videotape of that. So I've got that posted on um, YouTube, so you can actually watch like an audience in 1981 responding to uh, the homeschooling families and, uh, and John Holt and, and how they pretty much you know, are astounded at, at the things that, that, that get said. But um, so that's the environment that, that, that I walked into in 1981 and, and the magazine kept growing. So uh, I went from becoming a volunteer to becoming ad manager. And then I, I you know, after uh, Peggy left, uh, she was John's business manager and the whole office manager. I became John's personal manager as well as the, you know, the um, office manager, uh, managing editor of the magazine, uh, I'm ad director. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, uh, you know, after John passed away in 1985, you know, uh, I worked, you know, with. Uh, uh, Donna Rishu was the first editor. She had been a volunteer there and then uh, hired Susanna Sheffer, who had written to John Holt when she was in fifth grade. And she wrote uh, a letter to him uh, saying, I just read How Children Fail, and you're absolutely right. <laughs> so, and when, when, once I learned that, John actually suggested her to me as, as one of the, uh, you know, the, the choices uh, you know, for, for editor. And I was like, well, that sounds like the right person. And That's right. That was when she was in fifth grade. <laughs> fifth grade, she had that incident, right? And she corresponded with John since then. And that's why he remembered her, you know, a couple of letters a year, but, you know, they stayed in touch. And so, um, you know, she took up on, on the mantle of editor and she uh, did it until, I think, 2000. Uh, so 15, 15 or 16 years. You know, um, wow. and the last editor was Meredith he, Collins. And she, unfortunately, we only were able to publish three issues at that point before we had to close. You know, that's that's fascinating, Pat. Um, I, I love hearing all of the background to that. One thing that, um, I mean, it brought up so many questions as you went through everything, but um, it makes me think like with all of the stuff that he had come to when he was talking about the schools and basically kind of gave up on the idea of reforming schools, which which I'd like to talk about at some point here too. But it makes me just think like with everything that he found, why are schools set up the way they are? Why are formal schools set up in a certain way? It's like he had brought awareness to the fact that basically if you're not reading by grade three, then that's an issue. It's like, okay, is, is that genuinely in the best interest of the child? Or it, what is the reason for some of these requirements that are set up? And even for the, you know, the compulsory nature of it, like all, all of the stuff that basically, I think, started to ruffle John's feathers around all of it. Why is it set up the way it is from your experience? Well, uh, from what I've, uh, what I've read in the various, you know, teachers and professors I've spoken with over the year is basically 
it's ingrained in our society. You know, I mean, it's not just the United States, it's worldwide. I mean, this was something that Ivan Illich wrote, wrote about in Deschooling Society. He said, there is no difference between the way a school is run in communist China or Russia or the United States or in Peru. <laughs> you know, they all have the basic structure. Kids must attend specific times. The bell rings, class begins, you listen to the teacher, you know. And that, that to me was a great insight. You know, it says the only thing that changes is the curriculum, of course, <laughs> you know, what they're being fed. And then, of course, as John noted, you know, I teach, but they don't learn. <laughs> I think, you know, we're seeing that, you know, people go through the motions and, 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 and it's become such an economic engine. You know, um, I was just, uh, you know, thinking about this and I, I looked back at an issue um, uh, of Growing Without Schooling, which I have here, uh, oddly enough. And we were talking about, actually it's an interview with a professor from Quebec. His name was Norman Pinchy. It was an article called Breaking the School Monopoly, all right? And uh, so Susanna interviews this guy, uh, Norman Henchy uh, from McGill University. Let me just read, read his, his opening uh, sentences, which I thought were really, really interesting. Uh, the origins of compulsory schooling were basically to protect children from abuse, the abuse of ignorance, the abuse of vice, and that as time went on, this became extended so that schooling became not only a service being available for learning, but increasingly the major route available for learning. And then ultimately the only legitimate route for most people. The consequence of this was that governments became more involved. The whole thing became modeled on the industrial method of offering services. Right. And that's and that's like a, a, a really big issue for a, a lot of parents. I mean, you brought it up, you know, the impersonal nature of school. Like the, you know, it, look, you know, I mean, Illich referred to it in the schooling society, referred to schooling as the crown jewel of the industrial age because we can manufacture learning in these factories called schools. You know, and that's still a model, you know? Um, you know? And John was like, but that's not how we learn. Watch a child, you know? Watch an adult who's not in school, you know? I mean, yeah, we, you know, and, and this is the thing that, that I think it's very confusing for people. This doesn't mean you don't teach. It doesn't mean you don't engage in, in classes or, or in groups that interest you. You know, it just means that you're choosing it and if and you have access to it, so that you can participate, you know? I mean, when a child wants to learn to read, they learn to read pretty quickly. I mean, a lot of the studies on late reading show that, you know, when a boy learn, picks up a book at the age of 12 and says, I wanna read this, it doesn't take like six years before they can read it. It just takes a few months, you know, we catch up on these things. I think, you know, but in school we, we have to dole it out. In fact, it's gotten to the point now um, where school is just completely over, uh, overtook all, all the social aspects of our children's lives. I don't know how, how bad it got in Canada, but um, in the 90s, uh, there was such a push because test scores were getting low. And, oh, you know, that, that's the, 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 the gauge of all of a truly educated person is if they, they got a high IQ and scored well on tests. Well, what, so what was the solution? Kids need more learning time. So what did they do? They cut recess. You know, and then they push back lunch so that some kids in our public schools here in Medford, Massachusetts, were having their lunch at 10 in the morning because they were using the lunchroom during noontime for classes. It was just, you know, I mean, it, it was crazy. And, and there's still like the ill effects of that are, are, are still haunting us. And I think um, COVID, you know, bought, bought this to a lot of parents' attention, you know, uh, because the parents saw how much wasted time their children spent sitting in front of the computer while the teacher was dealing with other issues, and including technological issues, which are not their fault, but, you know. And then, of course, a lot of the kids in public school, their families don't have access to a computer, you know. Um, so it, it, it was really, it, it, I think it really made a lot of people question, why am I doing this to my child? Is there something else? I think, um, you know, I, I just a little bit from our background, we have three kids ranging from ages six to 19 years. And with my son, the oldest, when he started the school system, we were just mentioning this um, before the recording as well. Um, I had, I, I was in my twenties, I was really young. Um, I grew up having a strong um, emphasis on, on school and education, like that was 
big as far as my Persian background. And so I didn't really question it too much with my first son, <laughs> the poor guinea pig. And, um, and so I had him actually at an Emilio Reggio school really early on. And then I had him then transferred to Waldorf the subsequent three years following that. During that time, I was going through a divorce, so the finances didn't allow me to keep him at Waldorf, and so I had to transfer him to the public school system. And I saw firsthand the, the differences as far as where he was at and, and, how, and how his personality changed. You know, it's one thing that I as a mother or the parents weren't there to to observe his learning or to observe what actually he's interested in and what questions he's asking. Um, but at that time also Waldorf wasn't regulated. So I feel like Waldorf has also changed a lot since then. But putting him in the school system was, was really, really challenging uh, because where we were specifically the communities and uh, that were attending this particular school that I had him in, the parents almost appreciated the extra homework, the extra pressure on the kids. They mm -hmm. saw that as actually a way to gauge um, beneficial progress um, academically um, within the school system. And that's what the parents wanted to see, like a lot of homework being sent home. And, you know, this was the first time that my child had been exposed to numbers and letters, because typically, if you're familiar with Waldorf education, they actually don't start introducing letters and numbers until the motor skills have been established. So typically by the age of seven, which in Waldorf is grade one. So my my son was held back a, a year, which he wasn't happy about because in, in the school um because he had a lot of peers who were a year younger it made him stand out and as as a kid he didn't want to um you know be the oldest kid in the classroom but it's interesting because seeing him going through the school system like one of the first assignments that he received that he came home with was having to memorize all the important days of the year so like thanksgiving Halloween, um, Christmas, Valentine's Day. And I remember when he came home with that as a particular assignment, there were so many, but this was the first one. I thought to myself, what a futile way of spending and stuffing information into our children's heads. Like, and that was just what a calendar for. Yeah. <laughs> what is that for? How does that have any relevance to his um, satisfying his curiosity or his sense of wonder? Because also when kids are little, they ask so many questions. They're naturally inquisitive. Um, our little ones, a six and seven year old, are always wondering about everything around them, whether it be what they see growing in the ground or what, what type of birds are, are flying around, different types of animals, what they eat, when they're awake, when they go to sleep. Like they're full It's of an questions. endless barrage of questions yeah. all day long, <laughs> and <laughs> which it's, is amazing. And I feel like it's then, you know, when, when they do go into these regular school systems, they actually stop asking those questions. Like I saw it firsthand with my son because it was a completely different upbringing than what we're choosing to offer to, to our little well, ones. Well, and part of it is, I feel like sometimes what, at least one of the transitions I saw with that was that then he would just want to give you the answer. It's yeah, like, like what he had been right told, answer. that's yeah. the answer. And it, and in, it would see it even with the, with our younger kids, cause they're six and seven. So sometimes he'd want to give them what the right answer is where, the goal was actually not to come to a right answer. It was to like, there could be lots of answers. What, what's their experience? What's their curiosity leading them to? What are they seeing that's maybe different than what you've been just told is the right answer? So, I mean, it's just a very different, different sort of way of, of viewing everything, I think. Yeah, you know, we're trained by our school experiences, you know, to to look for those for those answers, you know, and, and the way that, you know, adults and children were supposed to interact, you know, I mean, a lot of people um, I mean, I know, I believe it's a Montessori concept of the teachable moment, but most people don't realize that moment just means moment. <laughs> you know, just like, like this, you know, instead of like 
everything that your child says becomes a teachable moment. <laughs> I mean, I've seen that happen in homeschools too. I mean, you know, and 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 so that's part of the what what uh, unschoolers call the de-schooling process. Um, you know, because uh, we're all we're all taught, you know, we, we, you know, and unconsciously we were taught too. You know, that's how, how adults behave with children. You ask them questions and then give them the, the information when, when they when they clearly don't get it. But we all know that the kids might get it and they don't want all that answers. Or, or really, I mean, you know, John Holt was always like, if a kid asks to read to learn to read, you you teach them to read. You know, you don't just say, oh, you know, teach yourself. <laughs> you, you give them an honest answer. And, and, and you work with it. You go and move forward with it. But, you know, when the kid says enough or you get that, the, you know, the eye rolls or, you know, the, the skittishness, you know, it's like, okay, that's enough for today, you know, and, and we move on, you know, but in school you can't, right? It's a 45 minute lesson, you know, and and so we're, we're really trained. So, you know, um, when John hated the word, John Holt hated the word homeschooling because it gave the idea that you turn your home into a school, which is the last thing that he wanted. So that's where he came up with the word unschooling. Um, at the time, there there was a Seven Up commercial. Seven Up is I'm not even sure they sell it anymore, but it was a, a soft drink in America, and they they had a, a, a salesman who would end the commercial going Seven Up the Uncola because it was clear and natural, you know. And so I think that's what John was getting at with unschooling. It's natural. It's you know it, it, you know unschooled like an unschooled musician. You know, I mean, they just have a natural ability. So. Uh, and, and yeah, you know, and he actually, yeah, you know, in, in his book of letters, um, he talks about like you know, with, with Illich, uh, or corresponds with with Illich about the word de-schooling and how that confuses things, you know. And 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 when I actually spoke with Illich uh, several times, I, I had the, the the great pleasure of, of knowing him. Um, he he describes says I, he was in Mexico when the publisher called him up saying, you know, I they couldn't come up with a title for the book. You know, and so, uh, you know, if you've ever read it, I mean, Yvonne, it, it, it's just jam. It's only like 120 pages long, but it's just jam packed with, with like really big ideas, you know. And so uh, Yvonne was struggling with different book titles. They're going by. And then all of a sudden, like his editor suggested, I think we should go with the schooling society. And before Yvonne could say anything, the phone connection was lost. And back oh. in those days, it was landlines. And that was the end of the deal. Next thing you know, that was the title on the contract and we went along with it. You know? Oh, interesting. So, you know, you said something really interesting, Pat, um, earlier. You said children need, um, need to be nurtured, not instructed all the time. And it's such a simple phrase, but I didn't really even have any concept of what that even means until COVID came along. And then because what you typically do, you know, you're when when a child, when a baby comes along as as a parent, um, you're you're overwhelmed with the amount of responsibility based on the need of this baby, and and so how it's kind of set up is that you almost in the background look forward <laughs> to the time when you can have help and assistance and support. I mean, this is how our society is also set up in that we don't have a whole lot of familial support, much like the, the rest of the world that is not within the Western, living within the Western society. So what we feel is support is to actually, you know, hand them over to somebody else, usually a stranger, you know, whether it be a daycare setting or a school setting. Uh, so that somebody else can can take care of them so that the parent can get a bit of a break. And, you know, upon reflection, I was really honest with it. And this is I, I'm, I'm stating my honest opinion as far as what my process was like. And so I know that daycare wasn't an option for me because I had uh, done um, I had a bit of a background working at daycares. And I knew that a lot of people who work within a daycare setting were actually not wanting to necessarily be there and I didn't want to have my young child within that setting anymore with my uh, second and third child. However, I still looked forward to a time when they would start school so that I can have a breather mm -hmm. and but then COVID hit 
And, you know, as far as the, the job that I had or was looking forward to returning to full time was no longer an option. And we made some major changes so that Jason was no longer working out of the two clinics that he was working out of. And we decided to move across country from central Canada to the West Coast. So we made a big move. My parents came along with us and we ended up anyway, rearranging our lives so that then my parents actually became a support group because we chose to live within one household. They live on one floor, we live on the other floor, which at the time was was shocking <laughs> to me because it's nothing that I would have typically had planned, but out of convenience and somewhat out of necessity at the time, this was our predicament. And then I realized that with COVID, there were a lot of changes that were also taking place that I wasn't okay with. So whether it be, you know, the masks that were mandatory for children in kindergarten or mandates that were being handed out by the government, which made it feel like, you know, the children were the property of the state rather than actually a human being that I had the privilege of parenting, that I was the parent of. So I wasn't okay with a lot of stuff, you know, and then this is apart from what has come since, which has been the SOGI and the, the sexualization, that education that has been introduced to the curriculum. There's a lot more has, has come, come forth, but I knew that I didn't want to partake in that. And then we started to just re come to the realization that no, our kids are here with us. And at the time when I was asking a few parents with, with older kids in, in our community here on the west coast of Canada, what do you do? One of our, our friends who are also going to be featured actually within the series, um, Katie and Daryl, they said unschooling. And I, at the time, I wasn't really even familiar with, with that term. Um, all I knew is that being home with the kids felt right to me. And, and the observation then that I was able to partake in as a parent, just being in the presence of my own children was such a huge learning experience because you're absolutely right. When you start to nurture a child and you're present with them, you start to observe, oh, it's like they, you, they, they like this, this one prefers this, that one prefers something else. This one receives information in this way, that one appreciates it a different way. This one, like our, our Sophie, she told me when she was ready, when she wanted to read, she said, mommy, I want to read this book. Like she came to me and I knew she had the readiness to actually start to read because she expressed it. Whereas, yeah. Whereas my son, on the other hand, who's 19, he wasn't interested at all in reading, which was so bizarre for me because I personally started reading when I was quite young. And I, and I to this day, we, we love reading. We have a huge bookcase and we're constantly reading books. But my son actually didn't read his first book until he was 16 years old. And even then, I don't think he even finished the whole book. He could read, but he just didn't wasn't, um, interested, wasn't interested in it. He wasn't really interested in anything until he was. Until it was like was, something grabbed him, and then he he did he excelled extraordinarily when he chose to because he had a drive behind it and he knew when he wanted to do that. There's a um, I forget I think I can't remember the title, but the authors are Dr. Alan Thomas and Harriet Patterson of um, Patterson. Uh, out in England, um, and they, they did a study on uh, homeschooling, particularly about late reading. And what they found in a, a, a less thorough surveys before they did this uh, had similar results. And that is children who are late readers who learn, but, but who come to reading of their own volition, read more for pleasure and information than children who are forced to learn to read. Mm. Yeah, in school and by third grade, you know, and, uh, and, and I, and, and that's been borne out, out in my experience with many, many different uh, homeschooling families, um, you know, over the years. Yeah. It's, well, and, and that, that, that kind of goes to some of the fears I'd love to mm -hmm. sort of run through because when a lot of parents make a choice that they, the 
formal school system doesn't resonate with them anymore. They want to do something different. And then they're looking to unschool, homeschool, however they want to do that, or, or even just a very alternative type of school. These are the fears that I generally find come up. And I was making a little list here of some of the ones that I hear. So these are some of the ones that I hear and probably people that are listening can resonate with this, but my child's going to fall way behind. Um, they won't be able to graduate or go to college or university. They're going to fall behind in their math and their reading. Uh, what about the importance of social interaction with their peers? Um, they're going to be left out. If they don't have a strict schedule or they're made to do things, my child's going to probably choose to learn nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, like lazy. If they choose to go back to regular school, they'll never be able to catch up. Um, these are ones that I've heard a lot of the times. I'd love to just hear your take on, on some of the fears that you hear from parents coming up and, and how you would address them. Wow. All right. Well, when we start at the top of the list and go down, <laughs> all right, I'll try to keep my, my, my answers brief. So the first one was, my um, child is going to fall way behind. Okay. Um, probably <laughs> if they're going to do the unschooling method, but behind who? Exactly. The public school? Sure. But the Waldorf school that says you don't teach a child to learn to read till our eye teeth fall out? Probably not. <laughs> You know, you know, it all depends on the curriculum. I mean, people forget there is a, pedagogy is not like a science. You know, I mean, uh, when I spoke with some uh, with French homeschoolers uh, several years ago, I was really surprised to learn that in France they teach reading through dictation. Dictation is like a really big part of, of their ch children's elementary school education. Um, you know, and 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 because they feel it helps you learn to read. I mean, I don't think anyone in America <laughs> considers that an, an option. You know. <laughs> You know, so, so yeah, um, you know, so, so that's the first one. Yeah, they will be up, but they'll also be ahead in other areas, you know. Um, I think that's a really good point. I was, a, I had that conversation with a friend of mine that um, was looking at doing it with the kids and his, his um, in-laws had both been like principals and teachers in the, in the system and um, had kind of said, you know, be very careful about that because they always found that homeschooling kids were always fell behind when they came back to regular school. And it just brought up the conversation around, well, even like- Behind what? What do we, well, behind what? And it's just that, like you said, that's that one system. And, um, and also I just feel like it depends on what you value, you know, like depends on what the system is that you value. You know, right now, you know, for example, and I've mentioned this before that where our kids are, some of the things that are valued are things like common sense, quiet mind, on reverence and all things like I value those things. And I think that's a really good template for my kids to value curiosity, um, which sometimes aren't maybe at the top of the chain on the values, maybe in the, in a more formal system. So I think these are things for parents to even kind of contemplate, okay, maybe fall behind the conventional school system. Is that what you still want? Or if it's not what you want, then who cares if you fall behind a little bit on that? Right. right. And, and let me give you an example, um, you know, from my, our, our own lives here. Um, my oldest daughter, um, who's now, uh, she just turned 38. <laughs> so, so, uh, but she, um, hated math and my, my wife loves math and I, I I'm middling on it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I do double laundry bookkeeping. I get it, but I don't want to get that involved in that. <laughs> but you know, my, my, she loves Sudoku and all those, all, all those math puzzles and stuff. Lauren was more like me. And, um, and so, you know, she was always getting in arguments and I kept saying, let's not argue, you know, it doesn't matter when she needs, you know, she knows, she, I mean, look, she, when she was 14, she was an assistant manager at a, at a restaurant, you know, she knew how to, how to, how to handle checks and, and stuff, you know, so I wasn't worried that, that her basic math skills were, were there, but um, she wanted to, uh, as most teenagers do, you know, explore some higher level stuff. So uh, we were able to enroll her in a community college when she was uh, 16 and she took a course in, um, uh, what was it called? Well, um, criminal justice. And it was taught by a Boston detective, you know, and she loved the course. And so this, she took the second uh, semester of it. And, and after that, uh, and he arranged for her to have, a, 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 all the students to have a ride with a, a police officer at some point during the, the course and to write about it. And that ride was was life changing for Lauren because that made her realize she didn't want to be a police officer, you know, uh, and not, not for any negative experiences. It was just that she she didn't, in her own words, she didn't want to become um, desensitized because she realized like, you know, when she was hearing the policemen talk about what they went through the night before and it's, it's mm -hmm. like, 
they were having coffee and donuts and talking about like these people beating each other up and I'm going to pull them apart. I'm not sure I'm cut out for that. Is you know, but what yeah. you what this did was it inspired her to want to become a psychologist and, and try and help kids from from teenagers from from doing these things. And so she wanted to take intro to psych at the at the community college and then went, uh oh, sorry. Um, you don't have enough math. You need to understand statistics. And we, she had no formal statistics training at all. So um, but this is something she really wanted. And so they suggested that she take the fundamentals of math course at the community college. She was 16. The other people in that course were adults or recent high school graduates. All right. And they taught that class in six months the fundamentals of mathematics, including statistics that she needed to get into intro to site. So she did that. And then she got so involved in this, you know, long story short, she got her master's degree in, in social work. She became a social worker in Houston and then here in Boston. And after about 10 years of doing that, uh, eight, eight years or 10 years, she said, you know, the only thing that's really helped me and personally um, to get through all this was yoga. And she said, and I, and, and so I want to be a yoga instructor. And now she's, she's been a yoga instructor for the last six years. She's run her own studio. She's opening a second studio now. She's so successful. But again, you know, so yeah, I mean, these things, you know, all right, she didn't know math. Then she did know math. And then it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> that is about sixty thousand dollars in, in graduate school loans. Okay. It's right. so, I was sharing that story with Taya because I was in the book, and I was kind of laughing at the whole thing too because it, it is it's like you just don't know, and it, and it it is yeah. it's like if you really want to know something at a certain point, there's usually a way to to make it happen, and then you're going to have the oomph behind it to to really do it. Like, I, I know when I was going through school, I really disliked math. And I, I felt like it was kind of never really felt like I enjoyed math. And then, you know, you're kind of pushed to do it. And then you just despise it more and more and finally got through that. But then what I wanted to end up doing, which was going into naturopathic medicine and osteopathy is like, well, you got to learn a lot of math and a lot of all the other stuff with it. And um, when I had to do it, when I knew like, okay, now I got to do that in university, because that was what I chose to do. Then I was all in and it actually came really easily once I actually applied mm -hmm. myself in a way. It, so it's like, you know, I feel right. like there's so much pressure on kids early on where it's like, oh my gosh, if you're not doing this by grade or three or grade know four. What you're getting into, you have to know what you want to do for the rest of your life yeah. at the age of 17. <laughs> and it just yeah. creates a ton of pressure. But that segues to the second fear that a lot of parents have is they're not going to be able to graduate um, or go to college or university. Well, that's that's not true. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, when I, when I first started at Holt Associates in 1981, uh, it was all over the news. This uh, young man, Grant Colfax, who uh, was raised on a dairy goat farm in Northern California, got into Harvard in the pre-med program. And like, how is that possible? Right. Well, he had written uh, about raising you know, dairy goats on his family farm, worked at the 4-H and, 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 and wrote articles about raising dairy goats that got published in, in adult magazines about you know, farming and agriculture and stuff. And he got into Harvard. <laughs> but of course, you know, everyone thought it was a freak. So um, uh, the National Enquirer, which is kind of like the I don't know if you're yeah. familiar, but uh it was popular in the 80s and they ran a headline goat boy gets into harvard <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean it was like so shocking and on end i i later learned and and this is also um on, on the whole website there was a, a someone else uh who, who was homeschooled and at harvard before grant his name is joel fields and he became a successful tv writer and producer in hollywood mm -hmm. and then i spoke at harvard at a at a radio broadcast they were doing from there back in the 90s. And one of the people there, a gentleman, uh, raised his hand and, and spoke into the microphone about how in the 1950s, as a homeschooler, he got accepted into Harvard. Right. And, and that's, you know, I, I mean, th that may be exceptional, but I'm, you know, my, my daughters have all gotten into the colleges of their choice, despite their <laughs> unschooling backgrounds, the homemade transcripts. But it's not just that. I mean, they had community college courses they could point to. They had other uh, um, accomplishments uh, that show that they were socially active and, and, and aware of, 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 their, of their future and trying to prepare for it. 
So there's a lot of ways that, that, that people get in there. And, and the other thing is why? I mean, only, I mean, only a third of Americans, I don't know what it is in Canada, only a third of Americans hold a, a four-year college degree, you know? Um, you know and, and I know when I got my college degree, I wound up working in, in, in the toy department of Abraham and Strauss department store in New York before I moved up here so I could be near my girlfriend who became my wife, um, you know, working in a bookstore. You know, and now they don't have liberal arts majors anymore. You can't be an English. It's like on the way of phrenology, you know, it's just like not a major in a university anymore. So, you know, this idea that, that you know, school is going to prepare us for life is like, that's not really true. But we do need education and experiences throughout our lives to continue to grow. And that's what, what John was pointing out is like, you know, places like libraries and museums, uh, you know, all these civic organizations and social, social clubs and stuff that we've lost. I mean, everything's now just online, you know, if, if, if even at, at, at that, because a lot of that's behind paywalls, you know. <laughs> So, uh, you know, we have to figure out ways to make the world more accessible, uh, not just for children, but for adults, too. And I think that's that's slowly happening with these certificate programs, you know, for computer people. So they realize you don't need four years of college to, to make a, a good living as a computer programmer. And a lot of these people already know how to do it by the time they graduate high school. Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. hopefully uh, we'll catch on. But the idea, there, there's a lot of status involved have going to certain schools and having certain degrees and that's and, and that i think is is something that you know may change may not but you know and that's also part of the problem i think but there yeah is. yeah I, I would agree with that for sure too um i think the other one would be that um kids need to have the social action with their peers and they kind of feel like school's the main way that they're going to have that and if they're not if they're being homeschooled then they're going to miss out on all of that we will say oh just briefly before you get into the pat that I feel like the socialization aspect is just overrated. Like I feel like oh. we place so much emphasis on that and not enough on actually creating a family bond with with mm -hmm. our children and and quiet time and intimate time and connection with parents and children and, 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 and themselves and, and, themselves, and nature. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know, I mean, this is this is one of the the great benefits of, of homeschooling. Um, your peers are not people the same age as you. Your peers are the people who have similar interests, or or, or that you think you want to be friends with. <laughs> you know, because I don't know, they look cool, or they're doing something interesting that you want to do, or you know, and and so that's why you know. It, it's not a multi-age mixtures are very common in homeschool situations, you know, in homeschool co-ops and so on. Um, and also in life, you know, we don't know, you know, we're not all, you know, we don't all graduate as seniors from college and then, you know, wind up at, at work the next, all the same age. It, it's ridiculous. Neil Postman was a, an education writer. And I think it was called The End of Childhood was, was a book he wrote in the 80s or 90s. And he, and he pointed out that the whole idea of stages of child development got started with the curriculum. You know, it was the schoolmasters who decided that a child must learn to read by third grade. It's not a biological imperative. You know, um, everyone grows at different rates, you know. And so we're stuck with this big hangover of, 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 of all this stuff from the past that it hangs hangs on top of us you know like you know the idea that every three-year-old should just be with other three-year-olds and that's not true i mean you know families you know large homeschooling families you know they prove they prove that point all the time you know you know the younger is healthy you know or are taken care of by the older kids the older kids you know look, look out for the younger ones there's a a lot more to socialization than just being in a class together receiving instruction and that's and what about the negative so socialization gosh i can't tell you i mean i've been involved in homeschooling for 42 years not a, a a week goes by i don't hear someone say i i my kid has been tortured in school by the other kids you know or or the or a teacher or doesn't like my kid right or something like that that is you know that socialization and then here's here's the thing uh, that, that really got me during covid as soon as COVID hit, the first thing I, I, I said to my friends and that, that I wrote about um, in my blog was, was why, you know, why we know that 
you know, kids are not getting COVID as, as much as, as adults and they could be outdoors, you know. Why don't we just open the playgrounds, have the adults, you know, wear their masks and, and you know, the teachers will get paid. They'll still be there. But just let the kids have social activities. They need social activities. No, no. It was all sit that, sit at that desk and, and, and do the assignments. And now two years later, everyone, everyone in the school establishment is talking about the lack of social skills among children and how far they fell behind. Of course, they fell behind. They, two years of you, you trying to teach to the test, you know, we were lost because, you know, you, you didn't have a captive audience in front of them. And, and then, you know, secondly, yeah, of course the kids were, were going to be socially deprived. We deprived it. We adult, you know, homeschoolers. And, and in fact, I, I wrote about this, some, some school districts and, you know, actually kept the schools open, you know, um, you know, during that. So it, it was possible with accommodations. But at the very least, we should have acknowledged that children need other other people to be. They need the outdoors. They need to get out. They need to be around people and things, you know, and not just in front of a computer, you know. Yeah. Um, I think this and, and that's is something that, that I think our educators have really lost sight of. I mean, when they when they wanted to do away with recess and it happened in a flash, that's when I realized there's been a sea change, you know, in the way professional educators think about education. I think this poses a bit of an inconvenience for for parents sometimes in that they actually have to then make time for for children. So they're then then need what needs to shift then is then that the children are valued and prioritized over over work or over sometimes you know work can also be an escape like the, you're kind of trying to realistically honestly if we sometimes sit with this it's like we recognize that work could be almost a way out of needing to deal with you know not feeling comfortable in your role as a parent or not feeling comfortable in just your familial interactions or the 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 role that you've chosen to take or just i don't know i feel like as a parent sometimes you need to really make it a priority to like your children and want to spend time with them to then observe them to see what sort of a feedback you're getting from them and as far as what they want the direction that they are wanting to take where they're feeling inspired or activated that then the the parent then becomes the the caregiver to create that avenue so that the child can then learn effectively yeah, I mean, for sure, if you're if you're the one that's taking on totally uh -huh. homeschooling, I think what we're also finding is communities are starting to get together to figure out new ways of doing things as well. So it's it's this neat exploration that's taking place because some people just don't want to homeschool for whatever reason it is, or they don't are they're not able to because of the way their work is situated at the moment or whatever it is. So it's this combination of reprioritizing and then trying to come up with new ways of doing things that are probably outside of what has been done in the past. So we're kind of finding different people sort of stepping in going, okay, well, I can kind of do this. And then this could be another way where, you know, kids could come and we'll kind of create something here and maybe work with the parents on even what that is going to look like, you know, and, and so there's a lot of this and, and trial and error, I think mm -hmm. with it, just to see what's oh, yeah. working, but it's the process of even engaging in it and knowing that there's going to be something that, is is going to be maybe more beneficial from from that perspective than where they currently are absolutely you know um and you know certainly figuring out work i mean not everyone can homeschool if both parents you know have to work but they're they're i i, I i'm familiar with families that did you know two-income families you know split shifts um they set up relying on grandparents <laughs> to care and care for the children you know, and then uh, in recent years, like the last 20 years, have been slowly, I remember there's one in Vancouver, uh, learning centers would, would come up, you know, that were geared towards homeschoolers so that you could drop in and take a class in photography or hang out like at the North Star uh, Self-Directed Learning for Teenagers out in um, Western Massachusetts. They've been around for 23 years, you know, so you could take a class or you could just sit down in the lobby and, and meet other teenagers and talk with them, you know, and uh, come you know but but we need we need these places for adults too you know um and, and that that i think is is 
one of, one of the great difficulties, you know, uh, that we have as a society because everyone is defined by work, you know, and, you know, where did we learn this idea that, you know, your job has to carry over like to 12 hours? Well, when I was in school and I, and I know this is still true. And when I was in high school, they said we had to have three hours of homework a day. Right. So I was at the, you know, the commute and everything I was at and, out, and with extracurriculars, it was like eight to four. Then I get home around five, five thirty, and then I got to do three hours of homework, <laughs> you know? and and that's not uncommon in, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of uh, high schools, you know, in America, and it, it's kind of crazy, you know, to think that, you know, and then and then we have all these adults, you know, like I, I there was several articles in the, some magazines I've been reading about um, the work week going down to three days, and you know, people not going to the office. And, you know, and, you know, some of the angry letters from like people who like accountants and lawyers saying, I work 80 hours a week. I, I don't believe this, you know, and it's just like, boy, <laughs> that's rough. Well, that, 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 that's a really that interesting <laughs> point, though, because um, I mean, even in the introduction, I think John Holt in the book, he talks about his experience of just talking to lots of different people and, and seeing how it works. And a lot of people that's that's so ingrained in them is this idea that it needs to be you got to put in work hard and you got to put in your time and and be willing to often do a lot of stuff that you don't want to do and um that's sort of set up and then i think that gets placed onto the formal school system too that a lot of parents want it to be kind of like that you know like when Taya was talking about with her son um with a lot of additional homework because that was that was sort of what was going to make them learn to be able to put in the time and work hard and prepare for life. And, prepare for life. <laughs> and so it, it's kind right. of this idea that to really see a reform in the school system means we we need to collectively kind of relook at all of it. Do we do we want to participate in the same way? Is there another way of doing things? It's interesting right. because we've had this conversation even on a metaphysical level and as far as how manifestation works. So even as far as how we're approaching life from a really early age and setting our kids up for this really hard and challenging and dog eat dog world well that's what we're going to create and is that really the template that we want to bestow upon our children and carry on mm -hmm. well yeah. it reminded me of like when i was reading in the book and you were talking about the summer lapse right and the idea that mm -hmm. we lose a lot of um learning school learning during the summer lapse or that that was that was part of what was proposed and that then you got to put more time in and, and more time in and kind of make up for that and um what they were actually showing was that when they broke it down you might be a lapse like in test scores in math which is sort of rote memory versus mm -hmm. the um, math um, deeper understanding and math reasoning actually increased or that actually mm -hmm. they found that certain reading skills actually increased with a bigger lapse. So mm -hmm. it's almost like we don't, having a little bit more time in between that can actually be a benefit. You might not need to have, you know, five days a week, maybe less days a week could actually be mm -hmm. more beneficial for learning. You know, it gets us to kind of relook at all of this that we've just taken for granted. Yeah, Dr. Peter Gray uh, who wrote uh, the book, Free to Learn. Uh, has been doing a lot of research on on, on this thing and, and um yeah you know if, if you read his blog he writes in psychology today too about you know how the so-called loss of learning that that occurs during the summer actually doesn't stop kids from learning more the next year in fact by having the break they those kids seem to do better than the ones that were in summer school <laughs> It's so funny that that doesn't actually get put into the system then, because that, that information is there. So it seems so bizarre that it's like, if that's there and we know that, is it, it seems like this is, this is what I feel like happens in general with science now, is we kind of just pick which science we want to want to pay attention to. So you mm -hmm. could pay attention to, well, test scores drop down. And if they want to focus on just test scores, then you could create a pretty good argument that says, well, learning diminishes with um, summer breaks because test scores in this or this will go down. You like you'll mm -hmm. you'll lose that learning, but that's not that's that's one small little aspect of what you're trying to pick out as being learning. There, there are so many different ways that that we could uh, be approaching the situation, and every family find finds their own unique path. You know, um, <clears throat> you know, for us, you know, we we always felt that there was a door, a swinging door between the home and the school. 
you know, so when I, if our daughters had a good reason, and, and, and I could see the school right through my office window here, it's literally around the corner from me. Um, it, it's, it's now owned by Tufts University as an administrative building, but when my kids were young, that was a, a, a grades one through six uh, school. And so my daughters were always curious because, you know, all their friends would leave the neighborhood and go to the school. And uh, um, Audrey, our youngest, really wanted to go um, go in. And I, I write about this in, in Teach Your Own, so I won't belabor it. But, um, you know, then she left. You know, her, te her teacher, actually, first grade teacher actually recommended that she go back to homeschool uh, because, you know, she had so many, she had 24 kids in the class in, in first grade and Audrey already knew her ABCs and had a, a basic arithmetic. So she was like, you know, she would be held back a little bit, you know, so she was honest with us about that. But then in third grade, she wanted to go back because her best friend was, was going into third grade. And so she did. And that teacher and her did not get along. <laughs> and, um, and so Audrey was there for, I don't know, maybe six weeks. And I got a call from the school principal <laughs> who knew us and said, uh, could you come in? Audrey would like you to homeschool her again. <laughs> You know, I, I love that you guys had the openness of just and, and that that's really, truly child led learning because you're really giving them the option and letting them have their own experience. And then they're figuring things out as they go mm -hmm. along. I, I think if, if we can all find a way to do more of that, that would be really, really beneficial for the kids. Like, just know that we can find other options. There are other options available for people. If one is really not working well, look for other that's, options. That's exactly right, Jason. Yeah. 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 And it's something that we forget, you know, school, you know, there's another reason everyone says that you just march through the 12 years, you know, you have no choice. Guess what? <laughs> you know, we really do, but you know, you have to stand out. And that, and that you know, brings me to this point. It's hard to be different as a child. You feel like if you're being homeschooled or unschooled, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm this freak of nature. You know, some kids really, you know, don't, don't have a lot of support for being different and the parents too. I'm aware of, you know, of uh, some friends of mine, you know, have lost friends because of, of homeschooling. You know, they didn't think that it was the right thing for them to do for their children. You know, um, although I, I know over time it's proven to be the right thing for them to do for their children. They agree. But, you know, it, it really upsets a lot of people. But, you know, we should have more choice. It shouldn't. Schools shouldn't just be a 12 year sentence and, and, and over and done with. You know, if you really believe in lifelong learning, as I do. You know, why can't I go take a college, just a course that interests me? You know, why must it only be offered from a community college, perhaps, that, I, you know, that's near me? You know, and now people say, oh, you could do that on the Internet with, with, with anything. To a degree, but Internet courses, you know, I mean, if, if we were sitting in your living room right now, this would be a completely different feel and conversation, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this helps. But, you know. I, I remember um, going back to my daughter, Lauren, uh, back in the 90s when we were trying to get her interested in math uh, because we were worried she, she, she wanted to go to college. So um, we're like, well, you're going to have to take the SAT. And so you should know, you know at least how to do uh, SAT math. And so we en enlisted her in a program uh, by the Princeton Review, which was one of the first online computer programs for teaching math. She hated it. Oh my gosh, it was just, it was just as bad as, it, you know, it was just a, a rote textbook thing put on the computer, you know, and they didn't have Zoom back then, so she couldn't, you know, it was only you know, email back and forth. So, you know, it was, it was a terrible experience. And so, you know, I, I've, I've seen, yeah, it's all evolved and stuff, but there's nothing like in person. You know, I mean, ultimately, I mean, this goes back to the social issue with, with kids, you know, in, in COVID. You know, we really need to be able to run and play tag and hide and seek as children. You know, if you don't have those opportunities, you're missing something more than just learn, you know, missing about how, how the number line and negative numbers work. You know, you, there's always time to learn that, you know. And, and as you noted earlier, Jason, when you need to know it, that's the best time to learn it. Yeah, you know, not the Swiss Army knife thing where like, oh, you know, didn't we teach you that Latin phrase in seventh grade? <laughs> you, know, you don't remember it? <laughs> you know? It's like shame on you. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, it ties me as we're coming to conclusion here. Um, from your perspective, what are the most important things that parents could do that would foster an environment for their child to learn? First, understand your, your children. You know, each child is different. They all have different needs, you know, um, and friends are important. So, you know, really trying to figure out 
how you can help your child. Like if, if they're like, for us, it was karate, scouts, um, some church events, um, you know, things like that, 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 that gave our, our, our girls opportunities to be with other people. And I think that it's the social aspect. And, and that's why we were so lucky because at the Holt Associates office, we just had a band of unschoolers and then we would put on conferences and John Holt had uh, one, once a month meetings where uh, and anyone could just come in and talk with him, you know? And so, we, you know, we, we were very lucky to have that sort of support around us. So it was very easy to have like-minded people, but, you know, find friends who, who, uh, who will support you in this, you know, they may not be homeschoolers either, but they support like, yeah, I like being around your kids or, 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 or stuff like that, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's not that, that uncommon. Um, but, you know, we do live in a society that treats children poorly. You know, um, it's, you know, John Holt said that he never expected more than two or 3% of the population of America to teach its children at home because they don't like kids. <laughs> it's obvious, you know, we just want to treat them as little consumers, you know, and, and then treat them like big consumers <laughs> as they get older. Like this idea of citizenship or individuality, it's like, you know, they pay a lot of lip service to it, but, you know, what it comes down to is standardization, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what a lot, a lot of it does. So embrace your child's differences and try to work with them, not on them, as John put it to me, you know, because I, I didn't, I didn't care about Barbie dolls. I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't care about karate, but, you know, I learned about these things and how important, you know, doll play was for my kids. You know, I mean, that fantasy play really, really was something. And boy, have they had a great laugh now in their thirties looking at the Barbie movie, you know? <laughs> but my wife and I were appalled when they were asking for Barbie dolls. It's like, oh no, we're not gonna bring them in the house. Oh no. You know? But you know, roll with it, you know. You know, you can you you can you can adapt, you know, uh, work with your children as much as you can. For parents that have made that leap, that are wanting to start the process of unschooling or homeschooling, they've taken their kids out and they're having a bit of a freak out right now on, oh my God, what have I done? Um, I do am, I right gonna, am I going to screw up my kid's life? All of this sort of stuff. What sort of words of wisdom from, the, from, the, from yourself, from going through this process and from other people that you've known, what can you share with them to help maybe put them a little bit more at rest? Every parent, whether their children are homeschooled or in school, suffers from those anxieties you know as i mean your your kid could be doing super great in school but feel miserable that's not an uncommon situation you know we read about like you know these 16 year olds in therapy who are nonetheless geniuses you know so it's not it's not the method you know or, or, or where where you're 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 homeschooling it's it's the relationship that you have with, with your child so the more the more you understand how they engage with the world, you know, as I, 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 for some reason, I was thinking of a neuro, you know, I know a lot of neurodiverse people uh, who homeschool their children, you know, and, and they, you know, they really get to know their child and, and the idiosyncrasies that, that happen. And, and those, that's an extreme example, but regular children, I mean, you know, give them the same respect that you would give an adult. Let them finish their sentences. You know, don't assume you know what they're trying to say or, or mean if they can't enunciate it because they don't have the, you know, particularly young children, they don't have all the words or vocabulary to, to express their feelings or what they want. You know, some of them very often they can only point or something. You know, I want that, you know. <laughs> Discovering, you know, nurturing that, you know, and, and then I guess I would, I would end with this. Understand the difference between caring and controlling. You know, there's a care is not control and control is not care. You know, in school, it's very important to control. And, and I get it, teachers, you know, everyone's gotta be in a line. We've got to get everyone here. Is everyone there? You count today, okay, right? You're in a homeschool, you know? <laughs> it's like, you know, if you have a large family, it's a lot easier, but you know, people still get freaked out. And, and that's why try not to control, but to care. You know, um, and caring for children is, is something that that's becoming more and more of a lost art. You know, um, you know, I, I see advice columns, you know, where like people are advising, you know, oh, you know, they're writing to, to these advice columns. Should my child should I make my child do chores? Well, why not? 
<laughs> Why not have them help around the house? I mean, I, I, every kid wants to help cook or, or clean. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a natural thing, but then we make it unnatural, you know, Oh no, you're going to drop that plate. Oh no, 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 no. You know? So, you know, work with them, you know, and, and, and emphasize care, not control. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think we've made so many things that are inherently natural, very unnatural. And, um, and then that's why we get all confused. It's, it's almost like we just need to get down and really keep it at basics in a lot of ways. And, and I mean, basics, like when I'm thinking that, like, this is why I just find it so much benefit to have kids get connected to nature. I always find that the more that people can be connected to nature, you start to find that groove more in your everyday life in different ways too. You don't get stuck in your head and analyze. Because a lot of times when we do, it's because, well, I've heard this is wrong, or I think this is right, and this is wrong, or this is better, or I read this. We end up spending almost too much time up there, and I think we, we forget the just experience what the experience too. is coming yeah. up in the moment and, and a little bit more of the spontaneity with it. So. Mm -hmm. Pat, I really appreciate your time with all, all of this. I think this is a really fascinating conversation. Where can people learn more about the work that you're doing? Um, I, they can go to my website, uh, johnholtgws.com. And um, it's in, in the pro I'm, I'm in the process of revamping it right now. So you'll be seeing the old site. But in a couple of weeks, I hope to have a, a whole bunch of fresh material up there, too. So awesome. A lot coming. <laughs> Wonderful. We'll have all of those links in the show notes and people can check that stuff out. Um, any final words? Thank you so much. I, I think even the um, key with what you were speaking of, um, where the child is getting involved in everyday sort of activities or chores or what have you, is that the parent's standard of of that task needing to be fulfilled also has to be adjusted. <laughs> And I'm right. speaking from my own right. experience. So it's like yeah. if you're asking the child to like cut vegetables or uh, wash dishes <laughs> or clean the bathroom, mm -hmm. don't let the standard of how you do things be the standard to which you're needing your child to fulfill that task. So just yeah. be aware that the, the, the goal is to allow the child to be involved and to create confidence within their mm -hmm. ability. So give them some leeway with that. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. All right, thank Patrick. You so thank much, you Pat. so much. We My will pleasure. have to do a follow-up in the future. Yeah. Take thank care. You. <laughs> Bye -bye.